I was born in rural Kentucky in the United States in 1947. And I grew up in a rural agricultural community. Uh, my family and my roots were uh, in the country, as it were. Um, I spent most of my youth uh, on my grandmother's farm. My grandmother was uh, a renowned faith healer in her community. And she was also what was called at the time a Kentucky root doctor which was simply a, a person versed in herbal medicine uh, of the Appalachian and, and uh, uh, Appalachian areas of, of Kentucky. Um, so, uh, and my grandmother learned all that from her grandmother, who was full-blood Native American Cherokee Shawnee. Uh, so it passed through, through my family line uh, in alternate generations, from grandmother to grandchild, and, and on, and um, consequently that passed from, from uh, my grandmother on to me and my sister, uh, who still lives in the United States and who is herself very well versed in, uh, in uh, herbal medicine. Her specialty has been focused on, uh, on North American medicinal plants and North American medicine and her uh, medicine practice. The um, progression that I made uh, was coming out of those roots and out of those experiences uh, with my own grandmother and of course as a little boy I didn't know how special and unique that really was and I guess I kind of thought everybody's grandmother did things like that uh, but I took an interest in it it was really probably the the seed that nurtured my uh, passionate spiritual relationship with nature more than anything else and uh, I was also, of course, exposed to um, um, pretty strong fundamentalist religious training in Christianity, concurrent with all this, which um, also influenced my spiritual development, although it did not establish my uh, trajectory and how my personal spirituality was going to unfold and manifest in, in my life, but it provided the uh, foundation for it nonetheless. So... Um, Spending time with my grandmother, going into the woods and fields and collecting uh, medicinal wildflowers when in season and um, digging roots and um, collecting other medicinal plants, things like ginseng and mayapple and sassafras and a myriad of other medicinal plants that she would uh, go out and find. She knew exactly where they were and um, um, how to find them, how to prepare them, how to make the medicine, how to administer the medicine. She always did that with a combination of uh, plant medicine and a, uh, an energetic healing process, which uh, in that culture involved the laying on of hands, as they said, and very intense prayer. So um, um, the process was very much, very much revolved around what could be defined as prayer healing or, or faith healing practice, but in, uh, in her practice combined with the use of, of uh, medicinal plants. Uh, little did I know that this was really a reflection of a much more universal, uh, very old uh, form of, of healing practice that is found in virtually every, every place in the world in one form or another. So this was just the um, sort of the, um, the remnants of the original Native American um, spiritual plant healing practices that have been a part of indigenous uh, worldview and relationship with nature in virtually all indigenous cultures um, through time. Reflecting that close, intimate, personal spiritual relationship with the, uh, the forces of nature and the, um, the connection with, with the uh, divine energy or the source, as it were. That progressed in my own development uh, in my teenage years. Uh, began to manifest as a keen interest in Native American culture um, because I felt a strong uh, connection with that, that being part of my own heritage. And so I uh, began to study and, and uh, do as much research as I could about Native American uh, culture, Native American uh, ceremonial practices and spirituality 
And the more I learned about that, the more I found a resonance that uh, to me made perfect sense and, and uh, provided that the kind of um, uh, reassurance that I had uh, been taught to expect through religion but had never really found personally. So um, as I learned, began to learn the basic tenets of Native American spirituality revolving around two central concepts, one being the sacredness of, of the earth and the concept of Mother Earth as, as our physical mother and um, a perception of um, the great spirit as an all-encompassing collective consciousness that uh, is that which imbues us with our immortal spirit. <clears throat> so um, it was sort of a realization of, of um, me as a human being being a, a child of a union between earth and, and spirit. So uh, that became very central to my, my uh, worldview and my, my own spiritual development at that time. And um, as I continued to study Native American practices and uh, ceremonies and rituals and so on, I uh, came across uh, frequent references to the use of another plant called peyote. And uh, I became intrigued with that for a couple of reasons. Of course, uh, not having experienced it at that time, I had no idea what its qualities were other than what were reflected in mostly anthropological literature I was able to attain during that time. There was virtually no popular literature available at that time uh, on, this, on these topics. And um, so I um, learned a lot about that uh, from what I was able to uh, glean from those, uh, those uh, sources, but really did not anticipate an opportunity to engage it personally because I, at that time I had no idea uh, how I would ever uh, acquire peyote or have the opportunity to, to engage it. So through a series of serendipitous events, it came to me. Uh, actually, interestingly, through more, uh, more ethno-botanical channels, as it were, I was able to acquire live peyote plants. And so following the prescribed ceremonial protocol and ritual uh, described by a, a famous anthropologist named Weston Labar, who wrote a classical book called The Peyote Cult, which described in, in meticulous detail all aspects of uh, North American peyotism, as it was called, or peyote practice among North American tribes. In my late teens, my uh, first encounter and experience with a teacher healer plant was with the sacred cactus peyote. And I had learned a lot about peyote through my studies of Native American uh, um, culture, spiritual practices, ceremonies, and so forth that began in my, actually in my early teen years. And uh, through serendipity, I uh, was um, gifted with the opportunity to acquire peyote through an ethnobotanical source, actually, through my, one um, uh, well, my scientific channels, as it were. And following the the um, protocols and guidelines and and um, um, ritual construct, I learned through a classical anthropological study of North American peyotism uh, conducted by a famous anthropologist named Weston Labar. I was able to um, who did a, a magnificent job of detailing his direct experiences with um, practitioners of of um, peyote medicine in the Central Plains of North America uh, and who um, thankfully violated one of the cardinal rules of anthropology which is not to become directly involved in, in one's subject. He did <laughs> and actually participated in the, the peyote ceremonies himself and, subsequent, and obviously had a, a very insightful inside perception and perspective on uh, what not only what the um, participants were experiencing, but the effects that it was having on their lives and uh, how it guided and affected their, their lives and facilitated healing of, of many uh, conditions. So um, 
that's that's actually where I started with with uh, sacred plant shamanism with peyote. And that was when I was 19 years old. That was around 1969, uh, seemingly lifetimes ago now. And then I continued to work with peyote on a continually progressive basis for a number of years, um, using that same approach of uh, studying the the uh, traditional patterns and methods of use of these plants that has always been my uh, guiding uh, light in terms of my training in this process. Um, I was able to apply that same approach to uh, work with the sacred mushroom of Mexico, which I worked with for a number of years as well. A period of time I was working with both peyote and the mushroom and finding a certain uh, mutual synergy there as well, especially in uh, with peyote as a superior teacher plant, uh, providing the kind of guidance that one uh, needs and benefits from in, in working with the mushroom, which has, um, shall we say, a bit more of a coyote spirit, a bit more of a trickster nature about it, and is consequently a little less trustworthy than the, than the, uh, the primary master plants, such as peyote. All of that led me then to... Um, a progression and an introduction to the Peruvian Mesa tradition involving uh, the plant which I call Wachuma, which is the original old pre-Columbian name for the plant or some phonetic name similar to Wachuma, Achuma, Wachuma, um, known and renamed in post-colonial times as San Pedro. So the, that became my principal modality and practice of shamanism rather early on, and I've actually practiced the Mesa for about 45 years now uh, on a uh, continually progressive uh, track, going from the more recent, starting with the more recent uh, colonial practices uh, and moving back into the pre-Columbian periods and uh, focusing now on the, the pure archaic mesada originating at Chavin, which is the the, uh, the genesis of the mesa tradition in central Peru. Um, so all of that preceded my arrival in the Amazon. I came to the Amazon actually um, rather serendipitously as well, uh, not by... Uh, personal intention even, but at the invitation of an old science colleague who invited me to come down here and assist him in some uh, biological studies here in the Amazon. So I uh, um, welcomed that invitation and took him up on that, came down and did my duty with him in, in the uh, wearing my, my hat as a tropical biologist. And um, from the get-go, from the very moment he said, uh, asked if I was interested in coming to the Amazon, the first thing I thought about when he said that was not tropical biology, but shamanism and ayahuasca. And that being, of course, a modality of shamanism that, uh, that I had not yet in, engaged at that, at that point in time. So um, I came to the Amazon. I um, served my uh, role as tropical biologist and then stuck around uh, after that had concluded to pursue my, my interest in shamanism for two reasons. One being the, um, my passion for shamanism as a spiritual healing path. Uh, but at that time, more urgently, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an avenue for my own personal healing, because I had fallen into a state of extreme chronic um, debilitating depression. And that was, as it turned out, uh, instigated both by immediate circumstances that I found myself in at that point in my life, but that was compounded by a, uh, an inherited predisposition to, to depression that, that uh, uh, ran in my paternal line, my paternal lineage. My, my father suffered that same condition, and as I found out later through ayahuasca, that has been a condition that has been present in my paternal lineage for, for many generations. So I had already, through my studies of um, ayahuasca, as I had studied all the, all the known uh, sacred plants, master plants involved in the practice of shamanism, I knew quite a bit about ayahuasca uh, coming in uh, academically. And so um, I, I had heard of its reputed um, 
ability to heal depression. There had been some limited references to that in some of the literature I'd accessed. So I thought, you know, that may be exactly what I need to, to address my condition because uh, the uh, Western medicine pharmaceutical route uh, wasn't working. I'd only even acceded to that briefly for a period of time right before I came to Peru. And um, I knew that that was not going to be something I was going to adopt as a lifestyle of, of taking antidepressants for the rest of my life. So um, I set out on a quest to find a, uh, an authentic, trustworthy curandero who could administer the ayahuasca medicine to me specifically for the healing of my depression. I was at, a, I was at the end of my line at that point in my life, and I was probably, um, probably a few months from committing suicide. It was that bad at that time in my life. So um, I found the right people. I was guided to the right people. Uh, I, I couldn't possibly have just stumbled upon them because they turned out to be too right for, for, for the circumstances. And um, they uh, initiated me uh, impeccably. Uh, turn, they turned out to be completely trustworthy uh, people of high integrity and pure curanderos dedicated to healing. And they administered ayahuasca for me in a single cycle of work involving four ceremonies. And um, when I came through that cycle of work, I was amazed at how clean and clear and unobstructed I felt. Um, I was, it was almost too good to be true, and I actually had apprehensions that it was just a temporary... Uh, feel-good state that would wear off and I would wind up the way I had been before. Uh, but the good news is it didn't wear off and uh, I've never had a depressed moment or thought since that first cycle of work with ayahuasca. So uh, given the depth of my condition, I feel that ayahuasca uh, absolutely cured my depression in a single cycle of work. I would not promise or, or uh, lead anyone uh, to necessarily expect that to be uh, the case in, in, uh, in every case. But I've seen so many instances where people have had the same kind of response uh, following the same prescribed uh, cycle of treatment. And um, there really is no doubt that ayahuasca is extremely effective in treating not just the symptoms of depression, but the causes as well. And all true healing is affected by addressing the cause rather than the symptoms. Western medicine tends to focus in many cases on the symptoms and alleviating symptoms. Traditional medicine focuses much more on the root causes of, of uh, these conditions, especially in the realm of psychological and psychosomatic uh, illnesses. So that was the foundation of my relationship with ayahuasca. Um, I had no ambitions or no expectations or no intentions of, of uh, becoming, uh, coming into service to ayahuasca at that point in time. Uh, that's something that fell on me gradually and slowly over the following two years, two or three years or so before I felt um, the calling, if you will, to, to learn the practice actually engage in an apprenticeship and learn how to do it in the old-fashioned, traditional way. The rest is history. <laughs> so I've been here in Peru now for um, the better part of 25 years. I've lived here full-time for 22 years. I've conducted the um, Spirit Quest um, shamanic healing work here for 22 years, every month for 22 years without a break. <laughs> and um, that, of course, has taken on many dimensions over that time in, uh, in both the scope of the work and the, uh, um, the people that have become involved in it. And um, working diligently to um, represent and carry forward this, this fine healing art at the highest uh, level possible. 
you know, ayahuasca works in strange and mysterious ways, and rarely as one would expect it to happen. Um, probably the um, the only thing that can be expected with ayahuasca is that it will not um, it will not uh, conform to one's expectations. <laughs> the scope of the experience may range from very traumatic and confrontational to very ecstatic and blissful in nature. Uh, most people, over time, in the course of their relationship with it, will have experiences on both ends of that spectrum. Um, the, the most difficult and challenging uh, works with ayahuasca tend to be, for most people, um, the most unpleasant, but also the most beneficial in many ways. And the reason is because ayahuasca uh, often brings up the very things that are embedded in the subconscious or even the deeper levels of consciousness that people are unwilling to um, confront, unwilling to deal with. Um, they may have a sense that they're there, but they also tend to procrastinate and put off that, that, uh, that uh, confrontational uh, address of that issue. So, um, when that happens, many people, because, because th that is often unpleasant to deal with, often kind of relate to those experiences as a bad experience, when in reality they are usually um, the opposite in the longer run. People often look back on those experiences uh, weeks or months later with great fondness and appreciation, and they realize the, the benefit and the healing that they realize through that expunging of that negative energy, those um, uh, things that were, were embedded in their deeper consciousness that were holding them back and interfering with their ability to experience life to the fullest and, and realize true happiness and contentment in their lives, to appreciate their lives for, the, for all the blessings and benefits that they have. On the other end of the spectrum, of course, are those experiences which... Um, our pure blessing and pure realization of all of those things uh, in a very light, um, luminous uh, context. So ayahuasca is, in many ways, uh, the classical yin-yang medicine, revealing both the light and the dark, uh, the balance of the two and one's uh, energetic makeup, um, allowing that the dark energy, the, um, uh, the negativity that everyone has in them to come out, come to the surface, and, and be released. And that is an integral part of the, uh, the healing and the, the renewal process and, and uh, realization that, that so many people experience with ayahuasca, is, is in letting all that go and letting it come out and releasing all of that, uh, all of that energy. Uh, so, as I was told when I first came to Ayahuasca, my uh, mentor was a woman. Her name was uh, Hermana Mari Luisa Tuesta, uh, a consummate curandera. And one of the first things she told me about Ayahuasca was uh, that uh, she always called everybody little brother, Hermanito. Ayahuasca is going to take out all the bad in you and leave all the good. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. I'm, I'm up for that. And so um, I uh, trusted her. I was able to surrender immediately to the medicine. I, I really didn't. I was at a point in my life where I kind of had nothing left to lose. So I, if I was, if I was going to die from it, I might as well die. I was going to die anyway, so I might as well go this way. So I had a had a, a very easy time in giving myself to it and surrendering to it because I I really wanted to get well really bad, but uh, and all else had failed. So this was. In many ways, perhaps my last my last opportunity. At least I thought so at the time. So, um, as it turned out, everything she taught me and everything she showed me about ayahuasca has turned out to be absolutely true. So um, I trusted her and I believed her at the time. Everything that she told me, then she took me into ceremony and ayahuasca confirmed everything that she said. And in the uh, 25 years that I've worked with ayahuasca since I started. I've had continual confirmation of all of that while receiving a new lesson and a new insight and knowing a little more about it every time I've gone in, uh, whether I've taken the medicine myself or whether I've simply been a uh, 
uh, a party to other people's process. Ayahuasca is an interesting plant in that as a teacher plant, it trains you to access the realms of consciousness that it facilitates um, to those who have not yet learned to do it on their own. So uh, the actual nature of ayahuasca is not to produce a dependency on ayahuasca. That is to say, um, one should never feel that they're going to need to take ayahuasca for the rest of their life in order to attain spiritual uh, realization or even to realize uh, many of these aspects of healing because most of that is actually accessible to us uh, within ourselves and most of that healing energy actually is released from within within ourselves that's um, that goes back to the um, to the word entheogen which is applied to those plants which reveal the divine within they are plants like ayahuasca or peyote or wachuma, which um, reveal that core connection with the divine that exists within every with within all things, not just human beings, but all things. And that, of course, that connection is where we find that feeling of oneness with everything. The um, the adage "We are one" is most dramatically realized in a state of reduced ego consciousness and heightened heart consciousness. Um, the channel of purest, perfect connection with ayahuasca and with all the sacred plants is through the channel of the heart rather than the mind. If one opens one's heart and finds that connection there, the mind will follow and usually wind up in the right places. Well, uh, ayahuasca is a powerful spiritual medicine. And uh, the spiritual healing with ayahuasca uh, largely revolves around what one might call an awakening. An awakening, an awakening of an awareness of the spiritual dimension or nature inherent in everything. And it really is a manifestation of a core shamanic principle called animism. Animism holds that everything is composed of energy, which... Uh, is a proven fact, uh, scientifically, and also the belief that all things have consciousness, that there is an element of consciousness or awareness embedded in everything, everything in creation. And so, of course, we humans are part of all that, um, but part of the realization of oneness requires that we understand that we are not superior to anything as well, that we are part of a greater whole and that uh, reality, even our own reality in the world, certainly that we know and experience, does not revolve around us. It doesn't revolve around humanity. Uh, we are part of a part of a greater system, and uh, we're in the wheel, as it were. And uh, spirit, uh, or the source, is at the hub of that. So, the spokes in the wheel are the various paths that one may find, uh, and one may follow in order to find their way to source. And uh, there are many spiritual paths, of course. Uh, shamanism is a universal spiritual path that has been, uh, it's, it's the oldest spiritual path, the original spiritual path, a spiritual path from which all religions actually are derived and have their roots uh, coming from uh, archaic shamanism. Um, so many people... Um, lacking a spiritual base in their lives, perhaps having been exposed to religion and found uh, aspects of it to be uh, um, inconsistent or hypocritical or otherwise uh, ungratifying in its message or in its effects, have turned to other, uh, the pursuit of other channels or other means in order to find that connection. And so that, I think, accounts for the... the um, current renaissance of interest in shamanism on a global level. Um, 25, 30 years ago, it was hard to find, uh, find anybody, in, in certainly in casual conversation, who had ever even heard the word, much less knew anything about it or knew what it referred to or anything of that nature. So that's, that's really unfolded on an accelerated basis over the last 20, 25 years or so. Uh, probably the roots of that began in the 60s at least the first uh, experimental renaissance, uh, which went in other directions and 
uh, did not succeed in its potential at that time. But what we're experiencing now is, a, uh, I would like to think, a more mature, more uh, a wiser approach with um, greater focus on, on spirituality and less, less focus on uh, uh, gratifying materialistic desires and pursuits. That latter thing, though, is, is one, of the, one of the risks and I think a threat to the potential future uh, efficacy of ayahuasca and its, and its ability to transform individuals and to transform culture. Uh, certainly, individuals who have an affinity for this kind of thing can realize great benefits from it. But it's a mistake to think that um, realizing the benefits of a holistic medicine like ayahuasca is as simple as simply drinking it and, and then um, not interacting with it in some way, not responding to it in some way to manifest those uh, improvements in one's life. Ayahuasca provides the, uh, um, the guidance it can improve one's fitness uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. But uh, ayahuasca doesn't do one's work for one. Um, the work is yours to do. Uh, you have to be willing to uh, do that work on a daily basis. That's a big part of the integrative process is applying what you've learned from ayahuasca and what you're continually learning. Um, ayahuasca is... Uh, ayahuasca could be described as a gift that keeps on giving in that um, the continuing benefits of ayahuasca are for most people felt for a long time after they've last uh, partaken of it. And it's unfortunately true that sometimes um, uh, partaking of ayahuasca too frequently can um, lead to a, sort of an obsessive compulsive relationship to it based on pursuit of the experience of it, the ceremonial experience, uh, instead of focusing on the life improvement benefits that one can experience and apply in everyday life. Um, the ideal scenario would be to work with a plant medicine to the extent one needs to gain that, um, uh, the skill set, if you will, to attain those levels of consciousness through, um, through other means. That is not to say they would never work with the plant uh, again, but um, generally people with greater experience who've made the most progress at a point begin to taper off in their, uh, their, their need to, um, to repeat the experience because the effects of the experience, the benefits of it, are staying with them much longer. One reaches a point where you, you realize... Uh, you know, for my personal needs, I don't think I need to do this anymore. Or at least I don't need to do it anymore for now. And uh, you can always leave that open for some future time when something might change. You might want to come back to it for a refresher or for a specific uh, condition that, that might benefit from it. But um, And then, of course, the, the other relationship is um, uh, often more religious or sacramentally inspired uh, that would be reflected in practices such as the syncretic churches uh, established, originating in Brazil, like uh, Santo Daime and uh, Uneo do Vegetal and, and uh, related uh, syncretic churches, which blend um, a aspects of ayahuasca shamanism with, um, with Christianity, mostly uh, of, a, of a Catholic uh, uh, construct. So people who embrace that are people who have a strong connection with religiosity and um, who desire or require a more religious framework or structure in which to uh, try to make that, that uh, contact with, with uh, the divine as they define it. And that's simply another approach, another perspective. It departs in many ways significantly from, from um, archaic shama, uh, shamanism. Um, but there are elements of, of shamanism uh, reflected in it as well. The most notable being a reverence for the earth and, um, you know, kind of a blending of, of um, pagan and Christian principles and values, which at a, at a point are, are very compatible and, and uh, blend rather seamlessly in many ways.
in in um, shamanic practice with ayahuasca, especially in the practice of curanderismo or, or pure healing, uh, in this day and time, because of the influences of Catholicism and uh, the uh, source countries where ayahuasca is a tradition, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, uh, you very commonly find a certain infusion or blending or influence of Catholicism coming mainly from the mystical aspects of, of Catholicism rather than the institutional aspects of it. What one does not generally see in shamanic practices is an importation of um, influence of the church as a as an institution of authority, and rarely is the Bible as a as a as, as sacred writ or as a uh, as a source of invaluable, uh, infallible uh, instruction uh, incorporated in ayahuasca shamanism. Some practitioners might, based on their own degree of religiosity, but um, in most cases, it focuses more on the mystical figures uh, and symbolic. Uh, representations present in mystical Christianity. The representation, for example, of Jesus Christ as every man, not just one person, but representing all humanity. And consequently, all of the attributes associated with Jesus Christ are within the reach and potential of every person to attain as a spiritual being through their own spiritual evolution. Uh, all of the symbolic events that transpire in, the, uh, in mystical Christianity um, have a corresponding meaning of interpretation um, from the perspective of um, shamanic worldview. Um, Santa Maria, for example, might be uh, interpreted as simply representing Mother Earth. And um, the Holy Spirit, the Great Spirit. So you have the same principal figures uh, in that interpretation of, um, of those uh, figures of, of Christianity that most Christians in conventional Christianity do not uh, interpret in the same way. They have different, different interpretations. So the shamanic perspective, that's one of the reasons why um, uh, Catholicism has integrated as extensively as it has with shamanic practices is because at a certain mystical level there's, a, there's an ex understanding and acceptance of the meaning of that that is not obscured by the, um, by the secular aspects of religious institution, per se. And um, what turns most people off about religions is usually the, um, uh, the, the hierarchical infrastructure and the uh, dogmatic uh, requirements that are imposed by someone else's interpretation or, or uh, uh, ideas rather than what one realizes through the direct connection with the divine on a personal level. Shamanism is personal. Religions tend to have a, an intermediary aspect that um, can be very biased and even uh, have its own, its own agenda relating to control, power, and so forth. Well, uh, <clears throat> ayahuasca is uh, well known to be a paradigm buster, meaning it will break, it, it will challenge preconceived notions that people have. In many cases, things that people have believed and uh, believed to be true maybe all their lives, and then they find uh, in the course of this work that um, further insights or, or added perspectives cause them to question the validity of those long held beliefs. Um, if one is a truth seeker, one will, one will generally find the truth through this process, but uh, that requires an ability to move past one's ego, to uh, still the mind and open the heart, and the truth, the channel of truth is really realized most profoundly through the channel of the consciousness of the heart, uh, without the distractions and um, delusions and um, agendas of the ego which can often be uh, uh, misleading or misguiding, and uh, often that, become, that, that is revealed to be the main, the main obstacle to spiritual realization is, is a lack of mastery of the ego. I think that the ego is a, is a, 
is a natural and necessary component of the human makeup. It certainly is. Uh, we all have one. Uh, destruction of the ego is, is, I think, not a healthy uh, objective. Uh, I think a better approach is to attempt to master one's ego by finding balance between one's seat of higher consciousness and a uh, sense of selflessness uh, and balance with the uh, ego, which is uh, primarily revolves around a sense of self, an awareness of self. So finding that balance, finding that harmony, and bringing that into one's life is, is a key to um, greater contentment, satisfaction, appreciation of one's life experience, I think. Ayahuasca is a plant that has um, great potential to help and heal and bring uh, great improvements into one's life. It also has equal potential to do harm. And so uh, how and where and with whom one um, undertakes a relationship with ayahuasca is very important. Uh, first impressions are lasting impressions, so how one starts with ayahuasca is, is very important in shaping one's relationship with it from the get-go. If one starts on the wrong track and uh, gets involved with people who are uh, unqualified or, or who have uh, hidden agendas or lack integrity, uh, who, who uh, may either intentionally or unintentionally misguide the person, uh, they may find themselves... Uh, on, on the wrong track early on and it's sometimes very hard to get retracked once that once that happens so being discriminating um, looking at the um, the qualities of the person with whom you choose to work is very important uh, the level of their experience the reflection of knowledge that they portray um, the integrity that they hold the uh, degree to which you sense or feel you can trust that person with, uh, with your life in, in certain circumstances um, are all very important. You, you really want to be selective and discriminating in, in who you would undertake this kind of work with uh, because there are inherent risks. Um, one of the qualities of ayahuasca is to substantially reduce one's threshold of suggestibility. And when one's threshold of suggestibility is reduced, that means that you are subject to influence by the actions or words or energy of, of someone else, especially if they know that and um, have some uh, motive to, um, to use that access for, for one purpose or another. The curandero uses that quality of the medicine to provide positive to, to channel positive energy and positive reinforcement to the patient to generate positive healing energy within the patient and that that's an integral part of the healing process it doesn't all come from the medicine the medicine releases a lot of that healing energy from within the individual so there's certainly an endogenous aspect to the healing process uh, the risks of course are that an unscrupulous person might use that same quality of the of the plant to um, embed suggestions that would be uh, intended to take advantage of a person in one way or another, to get that person to give them something they want from that person, or to, um, to actually cause them to have, um, you know, a, um, not just a bad experience, but a, um, a bad outcome to the work. Um, so positive outcome with ayahuasca is not a guaranteed thing. There's a lot of interaction, a lot of synergy involved with the, the other influences, the most important probably being the individual uh, engaging the work, but equally important, the, um, the integrity, the qualifications, experience, knowledge, the ability of the uh, curandero to uh, hold and guide and allow the energy of the plant to work to its fullest efficacy, uh, with aid and assistance as needed, but without interfering too much with that personal connection. The nature of shamanism is personal, and the, uh, uh, the greatest benefits are realized through achieving that personal connection. So the shaman or curandero is a guide, a helper, um, but um, the most important 
aspects of the relationship ultimately are how one forms uh, their personal relationship uh, with the plant, with the energy of the plant. Ayahuasca and the energy channeled by ayahuasca is a direct expression of the natural environment and the culture from which it is derived. Consequently, one will invariably have a more pure, deeper, more authentic connection or relationship with ayahuasca when it is undertaken in its natural environment, which is the Amazon. That is not to say that one might not realize great benefit from taking ayahuasca in other settings or in other places. Um, to assume, however, that those are equivalent uh, would be um, an assumption that probably would not be uh, would not hold up if one had a uh, legitimate base of comparison, which is to say, uh, having particularly having their first experiences in the Amazon and then later taking ayahuasca in some urban setting in some city in Europe or the United States or or uh, Asia or Australia or somewhere else. Uh, <clears throat> again, this is not to say that dramatic, profound, positive benefits might not be realized in that in that way. But uh, most people would realize by comparison that there is a qualitative difference, particularly in the uh, in the nature of their in, in the nature of their connection with uh, natural energy and elemental energy, the forces of nature, as it were. So ayahuasca is strongest and most effective when taken in its natural environment, uh, both in terms of uh, ecological environment and cultural environment, uh, which is why I have uh, continued to embrace the traditional approach to ayahuasca shamanism without trying to modify our work in particular for, for Western consumption, as it were. My philosophy is fundamentally stated uh, and, and perhaps uh, central to my personal mission is to, uh, is to shamanize Westernism, not Westernize shamanism. Um, there, of course, is a, an, an, an kind of a conflicting philosophy that um, by Westernizing shamanism, it becomes more palatable and more, um, more accessible, more um, um, comfortable for people of Western birth and origin. But in reality, there are, are benefits in uh, stepping out of one's comfortable box, if you will, out, outside of one's uh, uh, cultural setting, uh, to undertake something like this. One of the key, the key aspects of, of any spiritual practice, for example, is a concept of pilgrimage, which involves uh, travel to a sacred place for sacred purposes with a sacred motive in mind, something other than just a trip. Uh, or a vacation. So that's one of the reasons why um, I personally object to the concept of ayahuasca tourism uh, in those terms at least simply because it tends to trivialize the process and it, uh, it uh, invariably imposes a certain recreational aspect or perception of it that at least in some people's minds uh, diminishes its, um, its actual potential importance and, and potential benefit. The globalization of ayahuasca is a, uh, is a reality. It's not going to happen, it has happened. And it's hard to envision it expanding much more in certain ways than it has even now. You know, certainly there can be uh, increased um, acceptance socially, culturally, politically, and legally. Uh, since ayahuasca is technically illegal in most countries in the world, uh, where it is not uh, uh, traditional practice. Uh, but um, whether this globalization process is, at the end of the day, a positive or a negative thing, I think remains to be seen. It depends on how people uh, embrace it, uh, how authentically people uh, come to understand it, uh, and how much people try to change it to make it over in their own image to mold it into what they want it to be rather than accepting it for what it is and, and uh, uh, accepting it 
uh, as, as it works best uh, for the purposes of, of healing and, and the uh, evolution of consciousness. Many people realize very powerful healing from ayahuasca, and not everyone realizes a spiritual revelation from it. Uh, some people realize more of a spiritual benefit from it than, than, uh, uh, than physical healing. That would depend, of course, on their, their personal condition. But um, uh, whatever, the, whatever the, the perception is, if one brings a clean, pure, positive intention to it and is willing to follow instructions, is willing to do their homework to, uh, uh, to find uh, people to introduce them to it who are ethical, competent, experienced, and knowledgeable, and know how to do it, and, um, and this involves more than having a few ceremonies themselves or taking a few trips to, uh, to Peru and doing a few retreats. That generally is not sufficient to qualify a person to, uh, to administer the medicine. A lot more depth of experience is really needed simply because there are so many possible outcomes. There are so many different ways it can manifest in different people. Uh, knowing how to handle all those situations requires a lot of experience, both personally and a lot of experience in uh, understanding of how it how it uh, works with different people in different ways, the different effects it has on different people based on personality, energy, motive, and so forth. So it's complex. It's not a simple thing, and uh, there's far more to ayahuasca uh, than what's in the cup. Most of it's not in the cup. The cup is the catalyst, but most of what happens with ayahuasca uh, happens um, even beyond the ceremony. Most, 95% of what one realizes and, and uh, receives in terms of benefit from ayahuasca happens in the integrative phase, not in the intensive phase of their relationship with it. As with all healing modalities and medicines, there are certain potential risks in working with ayahuasca. Uh, these risks are all um, all of these risks can be mitigated through appropriate measures, usually beforehand. The first, of course, is uh, considering the physical risk of, of uh, having contraindicated substances in one system when one takes ayahuasca. <clears throat> because of the enzyme-inhibiting uh, effects of, uh, of, um, of ayahuasca, uh, certain substances that may be residual in the system may become um, activated or, or um, hyperpotentiated so that the effect is equivalent to having taken an overdose of that other substance, that other medication, compound, including some plants as well. So uh, considering the contraindicated uh, medications is the first line of defense in, in protecting or, or reducing uh, uh, potential physical risk from uh, working with ayahuasca. Um, there's a fairly long list of, of substances that should not be taken uh, concurrently with ayahuasca, and some of these require clearance from the system for four to six weeks beforehand, particularly in the case of antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, um, things of that nature that um, have been taken for a long period of time. They tend to uh, have a long residual life in the system, and it takes several weeks to completely clear them from the system. So four to six weeks clearance of uh, those substances is extremely important, uh, and um, it could, in certain cases, be a matter of life or death. If a person has recently taken an antidepressant, for example, and, and then takes ayahuasca, there, should, there could be a, a potentiation of that um, uh, antidepressant that could be fatal or at least cause extreme discomfort and um, dramatically affect the, uh, the nature of the experience in an adverse way. There are other things that um, are not specifically harmful to cross with ayahuasca but which may interfere with or block or impede the effectiveness of, of the ayahuasca medicine. So in general it is best to have nothing in one system at all when one takes ayahuasca and uh, if anything is uh, is on board it needs to be uh, carefully considered in terms of its potential for interaction or blocking the effects of, of, uh, of ayahuasca. 
The other area of potential risk is more psychological and spiritual in nature. And it has to do with um, uh, one of the qualities that I spoke of earlier, which is that uh, reduced threshold of suggestibility. And the fact that um, under the influence of ayahuasca, one enters a hypnotic state. The state might be a very light hypnotic state that the individual is not aware of. And in other cases, it may be a more profound hypnotic state where one really feels um, themselves to be completely helpless or completely at the mercy of, of the uh, circumstance they find themselves in. That, of course, underscores the importance of carefully selecting the, uh, the venue where one is going to do it, the security involved, the um, qualifications and experience and integrity of the person who will be administering the medicine and conducting the ceremony, um, having some knowledge and familiarity with the people with whom you will share the space and share the ceremony with, uh, walking into a ceremony on the spot with a group of people you've never met before and having someone who you don't know, uh, who you just met, hand you a cup of liquid, uh, the composition of which you have no direct knowledge or understanding of and you're of course accepting uh, on trust uh, what they say it is and what they say is in it. Um, the ideal scenario to build confidence in one's relationship with ayahuasca is to actually be personally involved in the making of it and having that process explained in a way that um, that gives you a certain amount of understanding of the, the process involved, of both, both the, uh, the mystical energetic dimensions of preparation of ayahuasca as well as the actual preparation of the plants, the qualities of the plants, what they contribute, um, whether you want to take ayahuasca that has certain plants in it or not, uh, which is usually determined by the curandero and their, their particular lineage, assuming they themselves made the medicine. Another, another really important thing, I think, is to consider the ethic of administering medicine that one did not make themselves. Um, authentic practitioners of curanderismo would not want to administer medicine that someone else made in their ceremonies. Uh, so um, it's, best, it's always best to work with someone who made the medicine they're giving you. Uh, not only do they know exactly the composition of it, but their own energy is, is embedded in the medicine as well. And if you have a sense of trust and, and uh, um, you're willing to let that person guide and lead you, then it's, it's, it's a good idea to, to drink the medicine that they themselves made. We make all of our own medicine here, and everyone who joins in our work at the beginning of our, of our retreats participates in the, in the preparation of the plants and the making of the medicine. So there's a direct involvement with the energy of the plant and the energy of the medicine from the, from the start. That's, that's really important and very beneficial as well, I think. When the cycle of work ends, um, just about everybody has a feeling of, of uh, completion. Um, not necessarily a feeling of having attained everything they came for at that point in time. It's still a lot left to unfold. Um, new friendships have been forged, many of which will last a lifetime. Uh, it's very common for people who come to our work to stay connected for years afterwards, and in some cases they even coordinate a return to the sanctuary to do another round together with some of the same people they did it with the first time. So uh, the strong bonding effect that, that uh, comes from this process uh, in, in many cases. Uh, but as I, as I tell everyone at, at the time of departure, the work has really just begun. Uh, you've, you've received probably everything you need to receive at this point in time to take your life in your direction to the next step but the work in that is is yours to do and it's a it's a day-by-day -day process um, for most people after working with ayahuasca in a, in a positive and proper way um, ayahuasca will come to mind 
at one time or another, every day thereafter for the foreseeable future. And ayahuasca has a way of showing up in everyday life through little observations and little insights that one may have of common everyday events, maybe observing someone else's behavior or life or some event in passing that one um, sees in a little different way with a little greater depth of understanding, perhaps uh, seeing some applications in that observation to their own life or themselves in one way or another and which um, has a lesson attached to it. So that's the way ayahuasca has a way of continuing to, to teach and to provide that guidance on a, on a, on a sustained basis uh, long after one has had their last drink and ceremony. And um, it's been my experience, my observation, not just in my own relationship with it, but uh, with the thousands of people I've had the privilege of guiding into this and through the process, that uh, most people realize the greatest benefits of the medicine uh, in that integration as it unfolds in the weeks and months, months to come, and that often continues for years after. I've been very impressed and appreciative of the, the uh, enduring, sustained benefits that, that seem so evident with so many people as a result of this work. That's the nature of our mission. That's, what, that's, that's our intention, is to help people find that something that will really make a difference in their lives that, that isn't going to wear off in a short time. It's not just a temporary feel-good effect, but something that really changes and transforms their lives in a positive way. So um, that's what we that's what we try to leave people with and send people home with. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>